Hello. Good morning for me. Probably good evening for some of you. Hope you've had a good day, or if you're starting your day, I hope you have a great one. I think we're going to start this podcast with a little guided meditation. I think will benefit some of you. So I just want you to sit somewhere comfortable if you can. And just take in three long, deep breaths. Don't worry about how long they are. Just make sure that they're deep and you really, really feel the bottom of your lungs. Have your stomach kind of expanding to just bring as much air into the body as possible. In through the nose and out through the mouth. So unless you've consciously have a breathing practice, it's often the first time during the day that you've become aware of your breath and really strive to make those breaths deep, controlled, and just focusing on them in general. It's a very powerful tool. So we're going to do another cycle of that, and let's make it five breaths this time. So in through the nose, out through the mouth, really expand your rib cage, get those intercostal muscles working. And five deep breaths. Let's go. So, hopefully everyone's feeling a little bit more chilled out. I highly recommend doing something like that before every meal time. Helps to calm down your body, <clears throat> shift into a parasympathetic nervous state, which is a lot better for digestion. Obviously, when you're eating, you want to have blood flow going to the digestive organs. You don't want blood flow in the muscles as much not training you're eating so you want blood to be where it's about to be used so breathing like that can help shift your body into that state chill everything out and uh, you're going to absorb your nutrition a lot better if you do that before meal times that's actually why a lot of cultures have a a prayer before meals it's like a a cultural byproduct of that practice because it's biologically good for humans that kind of has stayed in a lot of communities and cultures because whether or not they were doing it for the digestive benefit, it seems like human culture develops to see that as like a a bonus. So today we're going to be focusing on testosterone, which is a huge topic, but I wanted to talk about some of the things that you can do to naturally increase your testosterone. I think there is a lot you can do if you're not purposely doing anything yet in order to boost your testosterone. You might be doing some of these things already. So testosterone is obviously probably the most famous of the naturally secreted androgenic anabolic hormones. It's responsible for everything that makes us men stimulates protein synthesis it inhibit <laughs> inhibits inhibits protein degradation so you're going to keep the muscle more when you have higher testosterone levels but the first thing that impacts it is sleep i kind of went into detail about this 
before last episode, but if you check out my sleep thread, there's a lot of tips and tricks on that. Uh, it's in my master thread, so have a look at that. But sleep is a big one. If you're not getting good sleep, your hormone production, especially testosterone, is not going to be as good. This is why when you first fix your sleep, if you're getting shit sleep, a lot of people will see benefits from that alone. They'll see body fat drop. They'll see increases in muscle. And it's basically because you're giving your op- your body an opportunity to rest where it, it wasn't getting sleep before, but also normalizing those testosterone levels, bringing them up. And of course, those levels being higher in the body means you're going to have higher muscle and lower fat. It's one of the reasons why men have a naturally lower body fat than women is the presence of high testosterone. So sleep is a big one. Consuming fats. So the production of testosterone is kind of limited by cholesterol. Uh, Dietary cholesterol found in high quality fatty animal meats, eggs, butter, coconut and olive oils. Uh, saturated fat in those sources is a building block for cholesterol which in turn is used for testosterone production this is why you can feel shit on the kind of generic fitness diets where they say no sauces no fats uh, chicken breast broccoli rice not actually optimal if you want uh, optimal testosterone production in the body because you're not getting those building blocks for the hormones that you need that's why i always recommend people to switch to higher fat diet Uh, that's a big building block for those things and it tastes better as well higher fat in meat is yummier so that's another benefit This is one of my favorites. So no porn, no fat, no cum. They're kind of meme names for the principle of semen retention. Everyone gets the feeling of being more charged up, or every guy at least. If you haven't busted in a while, you kind of, all of your male energy goes up. That's the best way I could describe it. Your, that kind of, just that crucial kind of male energy is you ask any guy that hasn't busted in a while and it ramps up and whether you call that horniness that's one aspect of it but your testosterone is going to increase that's that's the general feeling of testosterone increase in the body at least i find is that you have a more aggressive demeanor you have more energy um, so the, one of the things that I would argue first of all is doing no porn I know a lot of you struggle with that I have struggled with that uh, I'm glad to say that I'm kind of free of that now but it's almost like a, a topic in itself that I'll go into uh, later but getting rid of watching porn entirely will reset your kind of the baseline that your brain is set to in terms of your sexual attraction your sexual can you hear that it's a siren going past just ignore that for a bit (laughs) so porn can completely fuck up your dopamine because if you think about it it's it's quite simple if you're used to three 10 out of 10 hot chicks hd all you know point of view porn it's it's a lot more <clears throat> what's the word intense and than the let's say normal sexual experience with a partner they're not going to be a porn star obviously they're not doing the same things but cutting that out kind of resets your your brain and it takes a while 
but you get much more sensitive to the way it should be I think you know the way a girl walks past you holding hands becomes more sensual things like that because your brain doesn't have that dopamine blast of the HD three chicks at once kind of thing because to your brain that's your brain doesn't know the difference, right? Your brain thinks, oh, wow, he's such a lad that he's he's getting with with three hot chicks who are all, you know, ridiculously slutty and, and keen for him, but that's not really how real life works. But your brain doesn't know the difference. So your brain's thinking, okay, well, we have this. Why would we fire off dopamine for the smaller, let's say, benefit of one girl? when we have three hot chicks chain new girls that's the thing the other thing <clears throat> videos every new video that you click on uh i forget the effect there's there's a name for it but basically there's a new level of arousal for new partners and every new video is to your brain a new partner which isn't real first of all but is another reason why your dopamine gets so fried from watching porn all the time and I, I was watching porn since high school watched it for a few years it was just normal everyone of course every teenage boy well most but let's not say every but most teenage boys are watching it at that age and it just kind of becomes a thing that everyone does which is not healthy and I think is one of the kind of the things that we should be outspoken about and kind of spread to people is that okay what we've all accepted as normal in this society isn't that that great for us it's it's fucking up our relationships it's fucking up our biological chemistry and it's not something that we should praise or respect but, but not judge as such because people don't know they think they're told you know it's normal it's healthy to have a sex drive and it is but it's not healthy to divert that sexual energy to pixels on a screen which is essentially what you're doing uh something that i do to help me kind of <clears throat> that did help me break the porn habit was Every time I found myself watching it or about to look at it, I kind of imagine that there's a third person view of me sitting at a computer, my dick's out. Um, what do you, and it's just like you're lit by the computer screen and it's not a pretty sight. So <laughs> that alone helps to kind of break that habitual cycle. I think that's one tip you can use and I'll probably do a full episode on this uh, at some point but yeah basically it's not good overall everything else becomes more sen- you you become more sensitive to anything sexual anything in the realm of female relationships and you become more in tune with energetic levels. You can sense things more and the benefits reach out to other parts of your life as well, not just sexual stuff. Because your dopamine is, you get more dopamine hit from smaller things in a way because you don't have this constant influx of what your brain thinks is new partners in ridiculously sexy situations. So that, <coughs> excuse me, that dopamine sensitivity just kind of spreads out to other areas of your life so in general you feel better another aspect of that is if you're looking for purely testosterone production is not busting every time say you've you don't have a porn issue but you are getting with girls you definitely are more energetic and more productive and have that kind of grr factor <clears throat> if you're not busting nuts every day so whether you structure it so that 
you're not seeing girls as often or if you are seeing girls you can practice uh, a Taoist ejaculation principle where you will only bust one in every three times maybe let's say of course that means cutting out wanking if you're not sexually active and that'll go a long way if you're not sexually active but you want to be but you're wanking it'll go a long way to motivating you to find a girl or partner to do that with because you're kind of you've made the decision okay I'm not going to wank anymore let's see what I can do and I know the current situation of the world it's not that great for these things you can't go out and be social really talk to girls in most areas of the world at the moment but something to think about so back to the test production exercise of course lifting heavy shit uh, the acute endocrine response to a session of heavy resistance exercise weights generally includes secretion of various breakdown related and growth related hormones including testosterone when you lift heavy and train the larger muscle groups this is related to an increase in test so if you're not training weights this go, goes for everyone if you're not training weights do so if you're not training heavy squats or the big lifts I recommend you do so because the endocrine response to that from your body is quite high uh, compared to you know just doing circuit stuff or or lower weights <clears throat> again if you have access to the, the the equipment at the moment it's a bit difficult for everyone another way to increase your testosterone avoid heavy cardio so chronic endurance exercise such as cycling or running for hours and hours it's been shown to decrease testosterone because your cortisol is basically being raised for hours at a time so an increase in these excess cortisol levels you need some cortisol for various processes in the body but if you're doing a lot of a lot of cardio it's not really the best anabolic environment for maxing out your testosterone a big one uh, to think about is minimizing stress. So this kind of goes in, leads from the last point about your cortisol levels. If you're always stressed, you're always in a state of arousal, which just means your nervous system's firing. Your cortisol is going to be naturally high all the time, which is not good for testosterone production. So minimizing stress, and there are a few ways you can do that. One of which is to do things like the breathing exercise we did at the start of the pod. So cortisol can be increased by a number of things, notably excess stress levels. If you're always worried about your work, if you're always worried about a relationship in your life that's causing you stress, your body is exhibiting a fight or flight response to this perceived threat. Even though it's not actually a threat to your life or safety, your body sees this as something that you need to be aware for. So it'll constantly have you in a state of arousal, naturally high cortisol, which inhibits testosterone production. So fix your relationships. If you can do that, I know that's a easier said than done, but if you can either cut out stressful relationships, they're toxic, whatever, that'll go a long way to minimizing your stress, which in turn, will enable your body to increase testosterone. Breathing practices like we did before, uh, you wanna be relaxed for most of your day with brief bouts of high arousal in terms of usually around when you're exercising, you wanna be in that parasympathetic nervous state, amped up, yeah, let's fucking kill it, let's bomb it, hit those weights and then Afterwards, you chill out again. You go, okay, we've we've induced the stress, we've had all the all the training done, so now we want to chill out. Post workout, relax, stretch is a big one, and that all kind of all goes into reducing stress, which increases testosterone. 
Sunlight. Huge one. If you're not in the sun for a significant amount of the day, you know, 20 minutes, I would say, is, is the minimum. I would advise anyone to be in the sun. In the morning, get sun. Sun your balls, <laughs> if you can. Uh, there was a study uh, that I think I've posted on my Twitter before where there's a 200% increase in test levels when the testes were exposed to the sun. And this is because vitamin D is local, right? You're getting vitamin D production locally in the testes because all the testosterone is produced in the balls. This enables your body to create more of it because vitamin D is one of those building blocks that goes into testosterone production. So if you can in a private way, sun your balls. I'll start out with five to 10 minutes. Don't overdo it because obviously most men haven't been naked in the sun for years in today's society, which is, I think, <clears throat> if, you, if you haven't experienced that, <laughs> that kind of free spirited being naked in, in nature, if you can, if you have your own garden kind of thing, it's, it's an awesome feeling. Um, if you can't do your balls, that's fine. Just make sure you're getting out to the sun on as much of your body skin as possible. And there are so many benefits to this. Could probably do the, a talk about this, about light in general, all the different ways that it impacts the body. But in terms of testosterone production, massively critical due to the vitamin D that's produced. Uh, if you're in a low sunlight area, still try and get outside. You're still getting some light through the clouds. But another way to do that is red light therapy. I've heard great things about this. I don't personally have one, but I know someone like Ben Greenfield, he'll have a full juve set up, J-O-O-V, something to look at, like these specific wavelength of red lights that kind of mimic the same things uh, that, testos that uh, sunlight does. Um, and there are a few studies that have shown that red light therapy can increase testosterone as well. So something to look into there. Uh, plastics. Avoid plastic like the plague. I've really gone out of my way to not have any plastics uh, that I eat as much as possible in my life. So all of my food containers, I've thrown out my plastic ones and I've got glass there are a lot of good tupperware glass containers not only do they they're just they, they get they keep the food better but they also you're not going to be leaching those endocrine disruptors bpa all those kind of things that come from plastics and it's kind of pernicious in the way that it's in our society like everything's packaged in plastic which we then just throw out. Sustainability is another issue of that. Like we, we don't need to be creating a, a plastic box for every single thing that we sell because we just throw them out. They're not re being recycled. It's just landfill. It doesn't break down. So it's really just bad for the environment. So if you care about that as well, is one reason to try and avoid plastic as much as possible. But a lot of plastics have these endocrine disruptors in them as well. And endocrine disruptors are chemicals that will bind to receptor sites where hormones are meant to kind of plug into in the body. <clears throat> so these can either mimic estrogen or block where testosterone is meant to adhere to in the body. And it's generally not good for you. Uh, this is one of the things that I think are kind of leading to the feminization of men in general in society today. Uh, why you're seeing a lot of, a lot more at least, kind of weaker, less manly men is because plastic is in everything. These endocrine disruptors are leaking into everything, the water as well. BPA from receipts, don't touch receipts with your bare hands because that stuff can soak in through your skin. 
Um, if you're uh, working in a supermarket, consider wearing some sort of glove. I know that would, <laughs> if you're handling hundreds of receipts a day, that really can soak into your hands quite a significant amount. So, you know, Michael Jackson vibes, put some gloves on if you can while you're working. Um, you know, even even things, household products like cleaning products, air fresheners, hair dyes, cosmetics, some cosmetics and sunscreens all have these endocrine disruptors in it. Plastic being one of them. So any of these things that you can avoid, I would just try to do so. You know, endocrine disruptors contribute to cancer, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and even infertility. So they're really just a bad, bad idea for a lot of a lot of people to have in their day to day life. Um, and there are better options. So avoid plastic if you want to kind of get your hormone balance back to normal. Um, zinc and magnesium, both very critical supplements that I recommend anyone take, not even dudes that are just looking to improve testosterone. Uh, zinc is critical. <clears throat> magnesium is critical. So I use the ZMA complex, which is a, I think it's a patented mix of zinc, magnesium, and vitamin B6. And I have that before bed as well as a magnesium chloride spray directly onto the muscles it absorbs a little bit better sublingually through the skin so you can try those things they're going to make your muscles feel better as well as increase testosterone production specifically the zinc uh, <clears throat> just quickly some other testosterone subs that you can have a look at DHEA <clears throat> helps to make male and female sex hormones within the body kind of based on where it's where it's neat, needed uh, creatine and some Ayurvedic ho uh, herbs I think I'm saying that right Ayurvedic I'll double check maca root I definitely notice a boost in general vitality and sex drive when I'm taking that ashwagandha is the same anti-stress uh, doesn't taste that good so have it in a smoothie with, with other fruit or just pound it down if you're an animal. I have the powder. I, I know you can get it in capsules as well if you would prefer that. But ashwagandha is kind of a double whammy because you're going to be reducing your stress, which, as I said before, helps to increase testosterone production. Pine bark, pine bark extract is another one. And tribulus terrestris. So these are, again... There's a bit of scientific literature that show these do actually impact. If you search them on examine.com, you can see the kind of the scientific studies linked there. So read up on them, see for yourself if, if they're worth a try, but they're not going to be as impactful on your testosterone levels as you know, sleep, lifting, avoiding cardio, sunlight, and your diet. So yeah, check those out. And all of those things are things you can think about to boost your natural, natural testosterone production. And that concludes the first part of the podcast. I will see you back in a bit with uh, questions from listeners. Welcome back to the second half of the Soulcast. This section again, we're going to be going through a couple of questions that people have raised with me. How do I stay in shape if I'm an office worker? Now, I get this one quite a lot. I myself work in an office, so I know what the struggles that happen from working in an office full time. 
uh, I don't think it's a very healthy way to live. Unfortunately, it's what a lot of us are stuck in at the, at the moment. So how do you stay fit when you are sitting down the majority of the day, five days a week minimum? And how do you try and mitigate some of the effects, the bad effects that can occur because of this? My first step would be always make sure that you're training hard out of work. If you are weightlifting either before or after work, whatever fits into your routine consistently, you're really not in a bad spot because you have a concentrated hour or so of physical activity. You're igniting your metabolism by training. So it can actually be in your benefit if you're trying to build muscle that you're at rest a lot of the day uh, in the office, white collar work. I've worked as a laborer before. I worked at a, in a carpenter's a while ago and it's always harder to, if you're trying to build muscle that is, if you're working on your feet all day, lifting shit, it's always gonna be harder to put on muscle compared to if you were just training in the gym and then you're at rest most of the day. So it, it can be a little bit of a benefit being an office worker. If, you're, if you have a physical labor job, it's not impossible. All I would say is make sure that you're getting those calories in, like eating every two hours at a minimum. If, you're, if you have a physical job, even if it's just little snacks, like putting something in aluminum foil is a good way to kind of keep it in your pocket. Uh, eat on the go. I used to make little sandwiches like banana and honey in sourdough bread. You can make a couple of those as little snacks. Keep that in your pocket, in your work pants. Uh, if you're if you're doing laboring and you know driving between jobs and things like that. But as far as the office work goes, it's actually pretty good to be training as long as you are training, and then being at rest most of the day. Now there is a limit to that, of course. If you're not training very hard, if you miss a training session you're inactive for the rest of the day. <clears throat> so what are some things you can do to mitigate that? Regardless of training, I, I heavily recommend that if you're sitting at a computer most of the day that you get up every hour minimum, maybe every half hour if you can refill your drink bottle, things like that. But what I'll do is every hour I'll get up, I'll walk, I'll stretch, I'll try and get outside if you can do that just do a lap around the block uh, just walking hopefully there's sun out get a bit of sun but if you're doing that every hour you really are going to be more productive and you got to fend off you know submitting to the work culture of being chained to your desk I think that's a, a big one is like if you get anyone saying oh nice getting up every now and then you know like some people are weird like that they see it as like you're not working hard even though you'd be much more productive when you do get up bit of blood flow a bit of sun just clear your mind every hour or so just walking for five minutes really makes a difference i have a a tree that i can go to and i'll do a set of pull-ups every hour which is a really good thing to do i'll also do a few lunges walking lunges get those hamstrings and glutes firing which uh, become weak when you're sat at your desk all day hip flexor stretches uh, if you can fit all this in on your little break like it only has to be a minute or two of, of consciously stretching these things to make a difference you're going to be a lot more comfortable at your desk you're going to be a lot less stiff and because you're moving around blood flow to the brain you're going to be a lot more productive when you do sit down and, and smash work out again. So those are a few things that I do. Obviously, sipping on water the whole day, it's important not to get dehydrated no matter what you're doing. Obviously, your water needs won't be won't be that high if you're just sitting in an air-conditioned office all day, but it is still important. Um, another good one, if you're sedentary a lot of the time, is to fast. 
um, especially considering now with all the gyms closed. I'll, I've been fasting till like 11 o'clock each morning and maybe my last meal would be like 7.38 the night before. So that's a decent amount of time to be fasting, just under 16 hours. 16 hours is obviously the, the kind of ballpark for intermittent fasting if, if you want to do that as well. I'm not super strict with it, but I do feel better in the morning when I'm not stuffing my face full of food because it's the energy is not being used. So you just feel lighter, you get leaner. And if you're in an office, that is an option to just kind of, you don't have breakfast at home, pack something to have when you're at your desk. I have oats, berries, you can mix protein powder in there. Very easy, kind of packing in some glass Tupperware breakfast to have. You'll get the comments, you always do in a workplace. I find if you if you put in the bare minimum of effort, you're not buying lunch, people will always be like, oh, that's a nice lunch. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? It's like, well, I, I just prepare food, spend 10 minutes the night before. People act like it's magic. It's not. It's very simple. <clears throat> but, you know, people like that, they'll always say that. So you just got to kind of smile and be like, yeah, yeah. Um, I just like cooking or whatever. It's important that you don't come across as elitist in a way. There's a, there's a way to handle it. Uh, I would say try to... Like, I never eat the cookies or the cakes that are shared around offices. I'll just be like, oh, I don't, I don't like that. You know, that's, that's a good one. Rather than saying, oh, no, I'm watching, watching my diet or whatever. And you shouldn't have to explain yourself and, you know, to other people with what you can and can't eat or don't want to eat. But it, it does save a bit of a headache by saying something like, oh, not really my thing. Thank you, though. Um... And if anyone pushes that, then, you know, you can, some people are weird with it and it's just good to be able to deflect that in a non-confrontational way in the workplace. So fast until whenever, 11 or so, be really hungry when you first have that, that first meal. And I've also find the mental clarity of, I'll just have espresso in the morning. It's a nice little drink to have in the morning gives you a little bit of energy without slowing you down. Obviously, espresso has no calories if you're not adding milk or sugar. <clears throat> Another thing is going to the toilet. I'm sure you, you go to the bathroom every now and then. If you have a, a disabled cubicle, there's a bit more room. You can get in there and you can do some jumping jacks, some squats, air squats. If you're just even going into a, a normal toilet cubicle, if there's no one in there and just pumping out like 50 body weight squats get your heart rate going very simple very easy way to to kind of mitigate the effects of sitting down all day and the other thing about full-time work that i want to comment on is making the work work for you rather than living for the company and living for the work because and I know this depends on what area you're in. Some people will say, oh, I ha you know, I have to always be thinking about work, or always at work, always working in order to get ahead. And to that, I would say, great, if that's your long-term career goal and you really need to put in those hours in order to, su to succeed. I would argue that you don't have to and just be more productive in a smaller time span a lot of that time where you're at work is not as productive when you're always there and you're always like you just get burnt out after a while so what i say to that is if you can have your full-time work work at work but then leave it at the door when you go home you'll feel a lot better you'll feel less stressed really make a point of saying to people yeah I'll, I'll do work while I'm at work but it's not my whole life if it is your whole life great it, like and you're focused and you're 
you're making progress and you, you do want to put in the hours, that's great. Working hard is great. But for a lot of people, when they're in jobs that, you know, they're just paying the bills, you're not there for your whole life. You don't necessarily believe in the work. I would say it's important to compartmentalize that and work while you're at work, but then collect the paycheck and leave work at work. Don't go home with your work emails and all that. If you're checking them after work, it's not really the best long-term strategy in terms of your health and fitness. Doing your hours obviously is essential, but also making time for yourself is so important. So there are a few little tips and tricks you can do in order to make work not so mind numbing and draining and stressful. <clears throat> you really got to put your foot down in a, in a nice way in some work environments because some people, their whole life is work. Their social life is the workspace. And I don't think that's necessarily a great place to be unless you have a great company culture, something like, you know, the dream job working with on it, uh, the supplement company that Aubrey Marcus is involved in. They seem to have a great company culture where they encourage physical exercise because they know that it's essential for their workers health, their happiness and productivity in the long run. It's better for the company. So you can really make a point to stress that. Um, but most of all, if you are in a job that you don't necessarily believe in and that you don't really want to put in the hours and hours and hours, yes, you need to pay the bills. Yes, you should. Like, I'm not saying quit your job, but I 100% am saying take steps on your time off to move towards something that you do believe in, whatever that is, and take steps each night when you're at home and you have spare time. I know it's hard. I know not everyone can do it all the time, but you do have spare time sometimes. Maybe cut out the Netflix episode you watch before bed, and I know you want to relax after work, but you're not going to be able to move away from the quote-unquote shit job that you don't believe in unless you put in the work outside of those hours. Your work is for your work hours are for work and then your spare time, your free time during the week, weekends, side hustle, whatever project you want to believe in. If you need to study towards a qualification that lets you move into a new field of work, these are all things that you can do. And I recommend because that's going to keep you sane if you have that kind of side hobby thing that you're working on you know you're working just to pay the bills and then you're kind of spreading your wings and the long-term goal is to move away from that. The other thing is, someone mentioned this to me in a, in a DM that I... He said, Hey, uh, Sobra, um, I have the opportunity f to make more money here, but it is going to be a lot more work um, and it is a lot more stress. So what do you do there? And what I said to him was, if the increase in money is worth the extra stress and the extra toll on your body, the less free time, then yeah, go for it. But once you hit a certain point of income that you can pay your bills, you get a decent amount of savings, it's not necessarily worth it long term to sacrifice more of your free time that can be spent on growing learning in this in these other directions versus just promoting for the sake of it unless that is your long-term career goal so i would always err away from falling into that trap of increasing the income to working more but then you also you also have to take into account the toll on your body your headspace because it's not really worth the extra money depending on how much you're getting, even then, would I, you know, double my income if my health totally goes to shit? Probably not. You know, there, there are people that are very successful in their areas, bankers, they're at work, 
you know, 12 hours a day minimum, but their body's falling apart. They don't sleep. They never see the sun. They're never exercising and they're always on call. They always have to answer their phone and emails. It's like that company does not care about you long term to warrant this obsession with it, I think. So it's all about making the job work for you. The The company doesn't, they're not going to, you know, if they were going to save money firing you, they're going to do that. So try and shift away from that feeling of, uh, what's the word? Almost like a loyalty, like a forced loyalty, like, oh, there's that, that subconscious thing of, of the work. Like the company doesn't care about you. They drop you on the street if they could, you know, nine times out of 10, there are obviously exceptions. So you need to treat the job the same for you and like get paid, do the work well, but don't make it your life. That would be my point. That would be my takeaway. Work towards something that you like and enjoy and you can make money from. Of course, that's still important. I'm not going to say go save the dolphins if you you can't make any money from it and, and you can't pay bills. It's just stupid. But there are ways of doing these things. <clears throat> and it is hard, but, you know, nothing in life is worth having without a, a bit of effort. No, no good things come to you for free. So sacrifice, make moves. Um... Try and stay physical at work if you're in the office. If you have a physical job, make those calories, get those calories in. And uh, yeah, that, that's my, my thoughts on that. I think this will be the end of the second half. Uh, thanks for listening again, episode two in the books. I will endeavor to get everything out on youtube and soundcloud i know we're on spotify now so if that's a better listening experience for you go check that out it's on my twitter bio otherwise gumroad subscription uh they'll all be uploaded there and check out my teespring also on my twitter bio if you want to buy a t-shirt support me that's sick thank you for that i will be uploading more designs and That's it. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Peace.